Let's have Jason White come on up. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to jump right into this. Uh, the state of arts entrepreneurship, generating nascent data for informing entrepreneurship policy within defined U.S. creative and cultural industries. Um, and before I go into this, actually, a reoccurring theme that I'm going to be re uh, representing in this presentation over and over is the idea of a picture frame. Okay, and this has been a really good image for me going through this conceptual process. Because in entrepreneurship research, uh, as I began to review a lot, and I mean a lot, of the literature uh, on entrepreneurship and the way that researchers are thinking about the concept, I really began to, 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 to become um, much more um, interested in how people are framing the concept of entrepreneurship. Because if you, can't, if you can identify your frame, or a lot of the studies, when they don't identify how they are perceiving, how they are viewing the concept, when you get to conclusions, it becomes very, very hard to figure out, okay, how is this connecting to what I thought I was reading when I started this article? Okay, so for me, this has been a process not only of figuring out how I'm going to um, generate or um, view the state of arts entrepreneurship and generate data as thus far, but also how I'm framing the concept of arts entrepreneurship as well. So it's, it's really been an interesting thought process. Uh, for example, get right to it. What are we talking about when we talk about entrepreneurship? If we don't disclose that, you know, we may be thinking about new venture creation, which is the organizing of organizations. We may be thinking about change. We may be thinking about innovation, which is often um, changes that lead to discontinuity or changing the way that we actually do things, presenting a new way. Of course, we could also be talking about self-employment, and many studies do as well. Some of the guiding frames that have helped shape my view on entrepreneurship, um, and, and there are many definitions, of course, of entrepreneurship, but these are just a few that have helped carry the study. Um, you know, there's process definitions. Krakow mentions entrepreneurship and sees it as a dynamic process of vision, change, creation that requires an application of energy and passion toward the creation and impl implementation of new ideas and creative solutions. He also references more of an outcome-based view a process of innovation and new venture creation, both accomplished on multiple dimensions and aided by collaborative networks. So that really helps me to kind of think about, okay, how do I know entrepreneurship when I see it? How are researchers actually looking at the concept and, and how will they notice it when it happens? Because oftentimes with entrepreneurs, we don't say that people who are actually going into the process are entrepreneurs. We usually recognize them by what they do. We say, oh, this person has created a business. That's an entrepreneur. We say, oh, this person has led an initiative. But we often don't recognize these people until they actually uh, accomplish that process or accomplish that outcome. Um, ideally, too, like it's been interesting to be led by this last um, view, which is more of a focus within the literature, that entrepreneurship centers on the discovery and the exploitation of opportunities. And a lot of writers have talked about that, the notion that um, you can't actually engage in entrepreneurship unless you have an opportunity first to do so. Okay, so that really helps to define um, my frame uh, of entrepreneurship going forward as well. Of course, again, returning to the point, how do you know it when you see it? How have researchers viewed this? How have they framed the outcome of this? Uh, a lot of scholars on specifically minority entrepreneurship have viewed it as business ownership. That's entrepreneurship, when people create a business and the ones that actually own it. Um, legal incorporation. There's a thing called the Kaufman Index of Entrepreneurial Activity, which measures these sorts of rates globally uh, over time through, through something else called the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. And they actually look at rates of legal incorporation, you know, how many of these businesses, target businesses and entities have started, how many have dissolved, and what's the mid-ground there in terms of the survival rates of these types of organizations. And again, um, returning to the notion of organizational development. How do I know entrepreneurship when I see it? Well, I could see it as organizational development, or which is, again, is a process um, that I may not necessarily recognize if I see it, if I'm not a part of that process as well. So these are just really interesting ways to think about the outcome side of entrepreneurship and actually recognizing that process. Okay, <laughs> now we get to the hard part. 
arts entrepreneurship. Here's this new nascent field that is emerging specifically within higher education. And scholars are thinking about this too in a lot of different ways. For example, a lot of them say, oh, it's the creation of arts organizations. We may say it's change within arts organizations. We may say it's innovation in artistic fields. And of course, we may say it's self-employment in the arts. And a lot of the arts entrepreneurship education programs, uh, I got to tell you, are leaning more towards the bottom aspect of that. And that's something that we discussed, I think, last week at the Society for Arts Entrepreneurship Education Conference as well. The idea of, you know, are we framing this in the way that we should? Or are there other ways of framing this concept? And how are we really thinking about and teaching, um, you know, within our, our specific frame? So, okay, I have to frame arts entrepreneurship if I'm going to figure out the state of it. Naturally, uh, there are guiding frames of that as well that have helped uh, shape my opinion and the way that I'm looking at this. Uh, for example, Chang and Wisimersky have seen this process as a management process through which cultural workers seek to support their creativity, autonomy, advance their capacity for adaptability, and create artistic as well as economic and social value. I love the and piece because oftentimes when we think of entrepreneurship, we think so for profit. Um, and researchers often leave off this social value piece, which of course distinguishes um, traditional for-profit entrepreneurs from maybe social entrepreneurs. Um, and looking at how Chang and Wiskamersky are framing this, which is largely based on a, a review, a comprehensive review actually of the literature on arts entrepreneurship, this has really helped kind of inform my perspective more broadly. Um, at the same time, I've had the awesome opportunity to actually think about this and publish myself in this area. And I um, actually led the Journal of Arts Entrepreneurship Education with an article called Toward a Theory of Arts Entrepreneurship, which really, again, tries to figure out how this thing is framed. You know, how are we shaping that process and how are we recognizing it when we see it? Um, and in that article, I do state that, you know, I saw it as a process for overcoming common challenges and historical barriers to the production, the distribution, the exhibition, and the preservation of art. So at that time, I was seeing it more of, okay, well, if there are challenges out there and that are common for these sorts of creative workers, if they're encountering these challenges, naturally, we have to figure out a, a way to go around it, over it, under it, or maybe even through it which essentially is a frame of entrepreneurship that could be specific uh, towards the arts. The idea that, okay, maybe there's something common that we are all experiencing uh, that we could work together collaboratively uh, to help overcome those things. And of course, there are historical barriers to uh, these sorts of things as well. And uh, I have a couple of examples of those coming forward. All of this thinking really has led me to frame arts entrepreneurship in this study in this way. So in this study, I see it as a collaborative process by which artistic, administrative, and technical creative workers learn, I love that, learn to overcome common challenges and opportunity barriers to the production, distribution, exhibition, and preservation of art. I love collaborative too, because oftentimes um, when people talk about entrepreneurship, we've talked about self-employment. And naturally, like, Honestly, when you do this, when you engage in this process, rarely is it all uh, on your own. You are oftentimes leaning upon resources, people who've helped you accomplish this. Um, you may go outside for funding. Those people are actually a part of the process, whether that be entrepreneurship or even arts entrepreneurship. So I think that collaborative piece in framing it this way really helps to distinguish arts entrepreneurship from merely self-employment in the arts, which is not how I'm framing that in this specific study. Now we talked about common challenges a little bit, but I'm going to touch on some of these. Uh, in my review, I was able to find through mainly um, how sociologists are thinking about the creative sector and creative industries as well, but there are actually evidence of common challenges in this space. Uh, for example, um, there is a low demand for creative labor, which is largely brought on by an oversupply of creative labor. There's a heck of a lot of creative people doing this. And what happens is that since there is an oversupply, it often leads to low demand and higher competition for resources and opportunities for production. Um, also, 
when we talk about uh, the types of uh, the general types of products, services, and goods that creative workers actually uh, produce, more on a cultural perspective, on an industry level. Um, largely, these products are experiential, meaning that they have to be experienced first in order for people to really um, evaluate the value of it for themselves. And experiential products, goods, and services in the literature are often characterized by extreme demand uncertainty. And essentially, uh, demand uncertainty is the notion that, well, in arts entrepreneurship specifically, we're not building refrigerators, okay? So we can't do a study to show that, hey, um, there is demand for the refrigerator, and we're making a specific, you, you, you know, uh, object uh, for a utility. But oftentimes, since what we produce collectively is experiential, we don't really know if it's going to be hot or not. Um, we may make a, a movie, and it may seem awesome, and we may put a lot of um, money and time and effort into it, and it bombs. And how often has that happened in Hollywood? Like, you know, you, you go see a film, and it's like so much hype about it, but then you see it, and it's the worst film ever. So again, we really don't know if it's going to be hot or not. And one of the coping strategies that creative workers use for offsetting this is called... Um, it's actually called overproduction. We use overproduction as a coping strategy, which actually requires both a steady stream of resources and opportunities for exhibition. So overproduction in the sense that, well, since we don't know what's really going to be a blockbuster, a hit, or whatnot, our economic rationale is a little bit different from those entrepreneurs in the for-profit sector, in that we will continuously produce content, creative content, in the hopes that at some point, one of those is going to make a hit, and, re and, and, and through, those, uh, through, through whatever hit that is, um, we will actually recoup the expenses that we have spent um, creating this sorts of content more on an industry level. So it's an interesting way to think about it, and a lot of sociologists are thinking about this in that way too. Um, and again, to speak to the last part of this, um, you have this idea of demand uncertainty which often causes industry gatekeepers to screen the content um, as an artist itself or as a creative worker in the creative and cultural industries. You know, we can make all the content we want, but at some point we need distribution in order to get that out to make a return. And so you have industry gatekeepers who actually screen this material and that process is largely influenced by cultural taste as well. And so there are these connections that you can start to make when you look at this from a very sociologist perspective in seeing how maybe it's not so economically driven, but there is a cultural aspect to it um, that we really need to take into account when we're looking at these sorts of common challenges that are very general for creative workers. Again, um, at the same time, we are, um, we're, we're very in tune to the opportunity barriers, I think, too, in the nascent arts entrepreneurship literature. Um, there are a lot of studies that actually out of the UK specifically about the gender inequalities in creative and cultural industries in that country. Uh, for example, um, one study I found uh, stated that women were underrepresented in the UK creative industries, particularly with positions of higher pay and influence. Um, racism in the arts as well. Racism, yes, does exist in the arts. Uh, and I actually brought a really awesome book that has helped inform my opinion on this. It's called Challenging Racism in the Arts. There are about seven case studies out of Canada that really go into these issues that actually do happen. And so, of course, um, when these sorts of issues happen, um, they're going to present opportunity barriers or act as opportunity barriers to creative production, exhibition, preservation, and the like. And, you know, we have to be attentive to these broader factors that influence the process of innovation and new venture creation. Uh, for example, um, dealing with racism, again, one study, um, Russell K. Robinson's actually 2006 IMDB, that's the International Movie Database Study, on movie casting, it actually found that 82% of the roles were intended for Caucasians. Found also that within all casting breakdowns of that study, white was implied when the race was not specified by the scriptwriter. Okay, that's significant for actors going into the industry and actors of color specifically, because if you're denied the opportunity to actually um, do what you intend to do to actually act 
on a broader scale, this is going to have residual effects. Um, and sometimes I think about that too, you know, in that maybe it's not always about um, pursuing arts entrepreneurship in this frame because there is an opportunity. Maybe, largely, a lot of us pursue it because there is no opportunity, because we have to make an opportunity for ourselves and actually go around to uh, work with other people who are experiencing those common challenges to accomplish that. Um, I'll speak quickly to nepotism. Um, anybody ever heard the term, it's who you know? In Hollywood, yeah, that's all over the place. It's who you know. That largely determines uh, who hires who. And there's a lot of nepotism going on in that industry, too. And certainly, that presents an opportunity barrier, because if you don't know the right person to talk to, this is going to be hard for you to get into the industry to accomplish that as well for, um, in terms of production, distribution, exhibition, and preservation. And lastly, um, there's a lot of support in the literature on monocultural policies being an opportunity barrier as well. And when we say uh, monocultural policy, we're largely talking about cultural policy that pr prioritizes the needs of a dominant cultural majority. So I've kind of experienced this too, actually, in my uh, experiences with cultural policy. You know, oftentimes, I won't say names, but we'll, we'll say that we are <laughs> Um, producing cultural arts funding for everybody. Um, but when you look at the statistics and you find out that, okay, the large majority of this funding has gone to organizations that are Eurocentric or that are often, uh, often in the case, uh, they are perceived as elitist, you begin to see, okay, there's a problem here. You know, so if you, are, if you happen to be one of those organizations who are left out, um, who are not within the broader, um, uh, the broader dominant culture or deemed as uh, great or deemed as vital to the existing creative sector as well, you got to figure out a way to get the money anyway. Okay? So this, this also presents, um, I think, uh, in, in this frame, an opportunity barrier in the creative and cultural industries as well. So these are really interesting connections that I've been able to make through my uh, literature review process. So all of this thinking has really brought me to this big, huge question. Um, what is the state of arts entrepreneurship in Ohio creative and cultural industries? And I'm really thankful for my advisor, Sonia Mignon, who has worked with me for the last year in narrowing my scope, <laughs> which is, it was tough, too, because, you know, we, we have to figure out, okay, <laughs> One comment she made was like, you don't want to be doing this forever. So you have to kind of figure out how to put barriers around this so you can actually get the data you need to inform the policy suggestions you're after. So again, you know, in framing this in this way, um, I'm really trying to figure out a way to assess this process, assess the outcome of arts entrepreneurship across a certain territory. And actually, if I get it right, I plan to not only move from Ohio, but maybe even we look at Kentucky next, and maybe in two years, we do the same study and we can compare the data, you know, that we got from the first um, study in Ohio to the Kentucky study as well. So um, this has the potential for a lot of rich, um, or I think rich interpretation, also thick description as well uh, with, with this process. So of course, if you're going to produce a conceptual framework of this magnitude, if you're going to attempt to assess the state of arts entrepreneurship, you should have some guidance. Otherwise, you might be looking at the walls a lot. And uh, thankfully, I've relied on a couple of different sources, to say the least, some of which have largely kind of influenced the way I've been thinking about this. Um, Cherubo, Stewart, and Wisamursky's understanding the arts and creative sector has, have been tremendously helpful in, in, in helping me to think about the central role of creative workers within the creative sector. And we'll touch on that in a second. Karatko has been very helpful for helping me to think about, of course, entrepreneurship theory process and practice, but largely has been helpful for me to think about how entrepreneurship research has historically been conducted. And lastly, Forsen et al.'s multi-level approaches to entrepreneurship and small business research has been greatly helpful for um, giving me an understanding of um, how researchers um, research or how researchers conduct research on multiple levels of analysis within the entrepreneurship literature. So that's been really helpful in informing my frame as well. 
There is an assumption I do make in this research, and I feel the need to disclose that. Um, and, and it's because arts entrepreneurs, because I'm seeing them, because I'm framing them in this way, as both entrepreneurs and a subgroup of creative workers within creative and culture industries, because they're both. They're both entrepreneurs and they're creative workers. They are not exempt from the broader factors that influence innovation and new venture creation across the creative sector. Let me go into that for a second here and see. As you can see here, and this is um, Wizomirsky's model, and she's created this model of the creative sector with the notion that creative workers are central to this process. But as you can see on the outside of the model, there are three different areas necessary for cultural production and distribution. Um, for example, if I am an artist, um, the supplies and equipment that I need for production are not necessarily present. I don't just wake up one day with um, pencils, pens, um, paint brushes. I have to actually find those things um, outside the broader creative sector and draw those in. So if those are not present in the broader creative sector, a lot of artists are going to have a hard time um, you know, facilitating uh, art in the way that they do. Also, retail distribution. You know, if I, again, if I can't get distribution for the content I create, this is going to be really hard for me to produce within the industry. And so really recognizing arts entrepreneurs as a subgroup of that has really helped me to inform my conceptual framework as well. Okay, so I'm seeing arts entrepreneurs as creative workers here who take on primary responsibility for organizing, managing, and assuming the risks of a new arts-based venture situated within that space, situated within the creative and cultural industries. So in this way, I'm looking for the leaders, and there may be many. Again, it might not just be one person. So we have to be attentive to the groups uh, that actually collaborate, come together to collaborate to facilitate this process. And all this has led me to this conceptual framework here. Um, which is a multi-level framework for deriving the state of arts entrepreneurship as framed. And again, um, influenced largely by my literature review, I begin to think about this process on multiple levels. For example, on the macro level, the bigger, broader aspect of this study, I'm interested in looking at the entrepreneurship context across defined creative and cultural industries, specifically looking at the challenges, the characteristics, the demographics, and the motivations of entrepreneurs who work in that space. And that's going to give me a, bigger under, a better understanding, I think, of the broader factors that influence the process of innovation and venture creation in these industries itself. Of course, at the bottom it says that the data will be obtained via survey questionnaire, and this is actually the stage I'm in right now in data collection. I don't have time to go into methodology on that, but if you want to talk to me about it, I'm sure to answer questions about that, I think, a little later on. Um, I know I only have about two minutes, so I'm going to speed it up. Um, meso level, of course, this is another level, and for this study, I'm looking at trends and tendencies in arts-based venturing. This is a little bit more traditional, um, aligned with the more traditional entrepreneurship research, but just contextualizing it a bit. Um, for example, I'm looking at startup activity of arts-based ventures as defined, dissolution activity, when do they end, and also the survival rates. Hopefully, I'll be able to answer simple questions, like when a student asks me, um, how much on average do I need to start a dance company in Ohio, I will hopefully have the answer to that question, which is pretty cool because a lot of them do want to start dance companies and other arts companies in Ohio, and we should have those statistics. I can also tell them on average the ones that um, you know, lasted longest uh, did these things or, or you know, experienced these uh, challenges. So this is probably something that you should prepare for if you intend on doing that. Um, lastly, here on the micro level, you know, I, I, can't, I, I can't even, um, God, I don't even know the word, like the, the experiences of arts entrepreneurs themselves are so valuable to a study like this, you know, because it's not enough to just look at this on the macro and the mezzo, but the, uh, the aspect of prior entrepreneurship experience and merging that with current experience will tell you so much and give you such rich data and thick description that helps you to really figure out how entrepreneurs got the resources they did and what experience and challenges they've actually happened, uh, uh, what experiences and challenges they've actually um, been a part of. And of course, down here, the data for that section of the study will be obtained via focus group interviews. So ultimately, 
Um, what I hope to do is look at it in these three ways to inform more po uh, to to um, have more informed policy suggestions towards this. Um, the the you know understanding of the broader entrepreneurship context, merging that with uh, trends and tendencies in new venture creation, specifically arts-based venture creation, and of course capturing the experiences of arts entrepreneurs will of course lead to more informed policy suggestions for the broader creative and cultural sector, which I think is really important to stop making these sorts of policy decisions, whether cultural or entrepreneurship focused, based on um, your own personal assumptions about what people need. You know, really having the data actually is gonna help us to figure out so much more about what is needed. Um, oftentimes we wanna put um, um, ventures in neighborhoods, which may be arts-based, or you know, we may even have incubators, but we don't specifically know what the program should entail, the programming of those arts uh, incubators. So this is a really interesting way and a holistic way of thinking about the concept and how we may be able to assess this process and those outcomes across the broader state. And of course, there are a lot of citations and references for this. Um, yeah, but you know, I hope this gives everybody just an idea of where I've landed so far on this. It's a pretty big study, and, and largely so far, <laughs> it's been very tough to discover the frame of reference for a study like this. And I don't, you know, I don't stand up here before you guys to tell you that you know, I've figured out every single aspect of the study. I assume that as more data comes in, this definition and the way of framing is going to um, be modified. But you know, as I talked to Randy Cohen at the Americans for the Arts, um, he told me very quite quickly that we had to start from somewhere. And so I'm hoping that you know, through this, maybe it leads me to a deeper inquiry about this concept. Yeah, I think I'll end there. Thank you. Great job. I really enjoyed listening to your presentation. Um, so I was going to ask a little bit. So the first thing is you mentioned that uh, you were going to look at defined cultural and creative industries. So I'm kind of wondering, which, how are you defining that? That's a great question that I didn't have time to get into. Um, <laughs> that's here, been, here you go. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's been a tough process. Right. Again, when we talk about creative culture industries, what are we talking about? Right. Okay, so you have to define them. And I think something that freed me from the pressure of having to include all of them was the understanding that I don't have to do everything. Yeah. You know, maybe I'm just looking at these. Um, and I'm using Wizomirsky's model as a point of reference there because she's already kind of done the homework in that area. And so, um, of course, there's a rich process coming forward of classification. I, I can't right. go into that right now because it's, no. it's a mind sprawl. But, um, yeah, certain museums and heritage, cultural entertainment industries, literary publishing, there is a classification process built into my methodology that uh, Dr. Son Mignon has actually helped me to develop. So I'm certainly looking forward. I haven't gotten there yet. Um, but um, to answer your question, these are the general industries I'm, I think I'm interested in looking at thus far. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so I also wanted to talk, you talked a little bit about this idea of uh, I, kind of two things. One about the low demand for creative labor, and I'm, I'm kind of wondering if there really is a low demand for creative labor or if it ties into your idea of industry gatekeepers. You know, and I feel like um, there's so many ways to disrupt these traditional notions of um, distribution. Like, do you see that as kind of impact? Because, you know, there's, I don't know if there's low demand for creative labor, but there's low demand to pay for creative labor. But I don't know, you know, so I'm kind of interested in how you see that, the, the gatekeepers and the demand. Sure. As being um, related. I'm kind of fuzzy on it like you because this is what a, how economists are thinking about it. Yeah. Um, but sociologists are thinking about it in a totally different way. Um, what I think is more important, and to be honest, I haven't quite made a decision on that yet, but what I found helpful was learning both perspectives in hopes of maybe figuring out some sort of consensus to that issue. I, I don't think, you know, if you came from a, from a sociologist's point of view or an economic point of view, I don't think you're going to end up with a grandioso, awesome, you know, conclusion. But I do think it's important for us to figure out how, again, um, researchers are framing the concept. And, you know, what I really hope is that through a study like this, that definition 
um, will, in, will emerge maybe through the data, you know, so I can really figure out the position I take on that. Um, but I do struggle with that too. Like when we talk about creative labor, um, low demand for creative labor where? You know, is that really general all across or maybe that's in specific right. industries itself? Right. So again, I think what's missing is the data um, that we need to make a more informed conclusion on that. Thanks. Um, thanks, Jason. It, I learned a lot, and it's an unfamiliar field for me. So, um, just kind of, I'm going to try to get to a question here, it, but bear with me and feel free to clean it up, because um, I, I was really interested in the beginning when you were talking about like trying to define an arts entrepreneur or like entrepreneurship in general, and you kind of talked about it as this thing that was like done in retrospect almost, like like you're an entrepreneur when you've done this, and then I was interested in, in that idea when you came back later and you talked about like these common challenges and opportunity barriers and the fact that like somebody for structural issues might not consider themselves an entrepreneur like if that based upon that being ju judged in retrospect and I so I don't know <laughs> like this is where I'm having a hard time sort of turning it like, into the question that I totally want to ask although I feel it um, which is like something like uh, I get how do you help people negotiate those spaces because obviously you want like if you want to start a dance company which was your example that you pulled at the very end you, you, you know like there's you want to give people relevant information but you can't like there's a desire there that you can't quite tap into and so I understand why it makes sense to sort of use the entrepreneur label in retrospect but until you know th there is problems about like kind of withholding that term until they've actually made that jump, especially if there's opportunity barriers. I, am I getting any? I don't know. No, no, no I think you're making purposes. It's, <laughs> right, it's okay. Sorry. You, your frustration is shared by many entrepreneurship scholars. I mean, William Gardner has stated oftentimes that entrepreneurs are recognized by what they do. Um, for a long time, I was on that one. Like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. You know, when I, when I personally uh, recognize or say, hey, he's an entrepreneur, I'm thinking, oh, he's a business owner. Mm -hmm. um, he's a person who's created a business. He, and he is important. Mm -hmm. Right. He not she. Um, and I think that echoes a lot of the realities in the literature too. Um, but again, you know, what does it mean to approach that frame through um, more of a, or really through, I'll say our, because I, I am an artist from our perspective. You know, how do we see that process? I mean, oftentimes, I mean, it's no secret that um, artists <laughs> could easily be conceptualized as entrepreneurs at any day of the week. I mean, it's what we do. But again, how are you framing that concept is really important because if I'm seeing it as new venture creation, then the study takes on a completely different context. Um, if I'm seeing it as innovation, what artist is not innovative? Okay, so again, I think it's, it has more to do with understanding how people are framing the concept and again, here in choosing and making a selection and making that distinct and really disclosing that so that at the end of the end of the day, when I have this data or you know amass this data, it makes sense to a broader range of people. You know, so I think that's going to be a messy process because, quite honestly, entrepreneurship research is a messy process, um, and I don't think anybody's quite figured out how to research it yet. But maybe that's what interests me in this space is really drawing this into uh, the field of art education and the broader field of art education to address some, some realities that our students are actually having. You know, they're asking those type of questions about capital. How much money do I need to start a film company in this space? And I don't think we have the answers to that because we haven't been able to amass the data yet. And I think it's really important to figure out a way to look at that and to generate that type of information. Thanks. In some ways, piggybacking off of Michael, I'm kind of wondering, like, can you be a failed entrepreneur? Like, what does it mean if you're a failed entrepreneur? Does that count? Absolutely. And I think that's a very valuable experience. And a lot of entrepreneurship scholars would agree, you know. Oftentimes, the literature prioritizes successful entrepreneurs. Right. That's a mistake because we learn through failure a lot. So, yeah, you know, when I talk about the last aspect of that, um, I think more on the micro level. I'm interested in getting that prior experience, whether failed or successful. That's good data. You know, that's going to tell me, okay, um, what's led you or motivated you towards this new venture that you're undertaking? Um, do you have any prior experience? Maybe that's the problem is because you've never done this before. Okay, so I think that's a, a, I think it's a valid question and it's certainly something that I'm thinking about, but I'm not alone. You know, a lot of scholars in entrepreneurship literature are also, also 
um, reiterating the importance of researching failed entrepreneurship experience, if we want to call it that. I don't really see it as a failure. I just see it as part of the process. I'm going to ask, so, okay. I think my big question is, does one self-identify as an entrepreneur or is somebody calling you that? Because you said if it's, if it's, ret if it's after the person has done something that they're identified as an entrepreneur, it's an outside label, or can I say I am an entrepreneur and watch me do this thing? Um, I, I don't know. I think both of those questions are important. Um, I hate to reiterate this issue of framing, but again, you know, how are you framing and seeing that process? I think is really important. I mean, you can certainly see entrepreneurship as a process. You can see it as an outcome. And, you know, make no mistake, many people identify as entrepreneurs. But at the same time, entrepreneur, there's many entrepreneurs that don't identify as entrepreneurs. They just say, I'm a business owner. You know, I'm not an entrepreneur. I just started a business. So there's that discourse, too. Um, I think at this point within the arts entrepreneurship literature, we haven't had uh, time yet in the nascent field to address that type of question on a broader level, but I think it's certainly something that we need to look into, you know, how arts entrepreneurs self-identify to make sure we're not just labeling them as arts entrepreneurs, but, you know, and are there distinctions between those who label themselves as arts entrepreneurs and those who just want to start a business in the arts? You know, are they okay with being classified as that? Um, I, I think that's a really important question, you know, so I think going forward, that's certainly something I want to look into. Jason, thank you. This was wonderful. And I, this is really exciting to bring this arts entrepreneurship into art education. But I'm, I'm looking at that, that language and the language, as you say, it's a lot with working with the, the framework. And, and it's a framework that deals in um, terms like industries and workers and labor and all that's important to pay attention to but I'm but it is you know a framework that um, I heard you say once leaders and I'm thinking about if it's cultural workers or cultural leaders and and uh, thinking about leaders in a way that um, there's distributed leadership and other forms of leadership than the hierarchical forms that we're most common think of when we think about leaders. And, and so there's a lot of other kinds of um, frameworks or language or when you start to think about the state of arts entrepreneurship, which is just a difficult word for me to even say, let alone spell. <laughs> uh, and I also, I, I also were, am interested even in the roots of that wor word and, um, and where that, you know, how that comes about. So there's a, a literature that is a framework that you're based within and then I'm, I'm thinking about as you deal with gender inequities and uh, racism and, and in other areas that there's another body of literature to even disrupt that framework somewhat. And I think industries is one of that. I, um, Debbie sort of whispered to me at one time in your talk that, well, maybe what we do with our visual culture and gender journal, what we've done is entrepreneurship. I'm saying a couple times now, I'm getting better at saying. <laughs> uh, yeah, and and um, and this thing that we and I would say that had to do with this um, social value that we felt, and we move forward in that, and it's rather a mystery to us. Actually, we do end up getting money from that, and we don't quite even understand that, um, and that you know. So that's, <laughs> um, but. You know, but that was not like uh, the the driving force for that. Nor is it really um, when we think of our academic journals really as an industry. So, so really, your question that that Debbie raised was uh, has to do with can we call ourselves? Is that arts entrepreneurship at all? Uh, you know, or not? So I'm I'm just raising questions about industry and leadership and the work or workers in relationship to leadership, some of the terminology. Thank you so much, Karen, for that. Um, I have, well, it's been a mind sprawl trying to figure out language in this space. This is all new stuff. And so I think um, 
you know, it's more important for me going forward, I think, to co-create the language than it is for me to try to figure out, all right, how am I going to, um, you know, am I going to conceptualize this on my own? I think that's a mistake, specifically when you're drawing in such a transdisciplinary uh, process, too. Um, that's actually one of the reasons why I'm glad I'm here, is because I'm interested in figuring out how we as art educators view this, frame this, which is going to be different, like you talked about, from a lot of the business entrepreneurship terminology and literature I've, I've, I've written, excuse me, I've read, uh, which have influenced. And also, of course, a different space would be the creative cultural industries literature too. Like, they're thinking about this in a completely different way as well. So I, I think to, maybe if this can answer your question, going forward, um, I'm interested personally in co-engaging artists, um, you know, uh, innovators in the arts, as well as business owners and managers in the arts to see if we can co-create a language um, to really clarify what it is we're looking at within a frame like this. I think this, it's more important maybe for me to do that than at this point in time um, try to really land on solid uh, definitions, um, which is again goes back to the beginning of this presentation. To me it's all about how I am framing the concept and what I am looking at within that frame. And I think if I can get over that hurdle, I'll be very happy with myself about it. <laughs>